now a hearing on crime prevention in U.S. cities. Today, the House Government Reform Committee held a meeting on the issue and heard from New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, as well as Philadelphia's police commissioner and a Florida state attorney. The three-hour hearing begins with remarks by committee chairman Dan Burton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order, and I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written opening statements be included in the record and without objection so ordered. Today's hearing is the first in a series that will take a close look at the relationship between state and local governments and the federal government. Many of the most innovative and successful public policy reforms enacted in recent years originated at the state and local levels. From crime and welfare reform to education and taxes, state and local governments have led the way in reforms. For example, much of the highly successful welfare reform law that we passed in the 104th Congress was taken directly from reforms enacted in Wisconsin by Governor Tommy Thompson. President Clinton vetoed welfare reform twice, but once the law was enacted, it revolutionized, re revolutionized the welfare system across America, and the welfare rolls declined dramatically. Also in response to the governors and the mayors, the Republican Congress curbed the practice of imposing unfunded federal mandates, which placed burdensome demands on state and local governments. And while Governor Huckabee has abolished the marriage penalty from the income tax laws in Arkansas, we are still working to eliminate the marriage penalty at the federal level. So once again, we have a governor and a state far ahead of the federal government. The successful reforms in many states and local governments have been widely reported. However, less attention has been paid to determining the appropriate role that the federal government should play in helping them solve their problems. So we want to hear from state and local leaders across this nation on this issue. I think it's important to learn what has enabled these leaders to govern successfully. Over the next several months, this committee will hold a series of hearings entitled National Problems, Local, Solution, local Solutions, Federalism at Work. Through these hearings, the committee will highlight successful and innovative reforms at the state and local levels. The committee will learn through the showing that many of the solutions of the problems facing America originate at the state and local levels and not in Washington, D.C. Determine which existing federal programs best assist states and cities. Explore new ways that the federal government can help state and local governments in the most cost-effective way. And participate in the national dialogue regarding the respective roles of the local, state, and federal governments in addressing America's problems. An examination of these issues fits squarely within the committee's jurisdiction over intergovernmental relations. The states have often been described as the laboratories for change where new policy ideas are created, developed, and tested. Ideas are measured by the results they produce, and successful ideas are shared and disseminated from state to state. As new ideas are implemented and as public policy changes at the state and local levels, the Congress and the administration must reassess the role of the federal government. As old assumptions and ideas are replaced by innovative and successful reforms, it's reasonable to take a fresh look at the role of the federal government and its relationships to state and local governments. Today's hearing, entitled Fighting Crime in the Trenches, is the first installment in our series of hearings that does exactly that, reassess the role of the federal government. We will hear from three public officials, a mayor, a prosecutor, and a police commissioner. They have all enjoyed great success in fighting crime at the local level. First, we will hear from the mayor of New York City, Ralph Giuliani. Mayor Giuliani has been a leader in fighting crime for almost 30 years. He first served as an assistant U.S. attorney in New York. He then became an associate deputy attorney general under President Gerald Ford. In 1981, President Ronald Reagan named him Associate Attorney General, 
the third highest position in the Department of Justice. Mayor Giuliani also served as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York during the Reagan administration. And in 1993, he was elected the 107th mayor of the great city of New York. The statistics describing Mayor Giuliani's first term in office are nothing short of staggering. New York City has the lowest crime rate among the nine American cities with a population over one million. Overall, crime is down 50 percent and murder is down by 69 percent. Mayor Giuliani is in an ideal position to suggest ways the federal government can help cities fight crime. While crime is on the decline nationally, New York City's success has contributed disproportionately to the national trend. For example, from 1993 to 1997, New York City accounted for 38 percent of the total reduction in the FBI index crimes in cities with a population over 100,000. 28 percent of the reduction in homicides and 63 percent of the reduction in larceny theft. In 1997 alone, 146 percent more crimes were committed in Detroit and 95 percent more in Dallas than in New York City. In other words, crime has been reduced to a far greater degree in New York City than the national average. It deserves mention that New York City's success in reducing crime was accompanied by a 21 percent decrease in the use of force allegations against police officers from 1995 to 1998. And I'd just like to say uh, as an aside that I have been to New York City many, many times over the years, both as a private citizen and as a public office holder. And during the first term of Mayor Giuliani, I want to tell you, New York City has been transformed. You can walk through Manhattan without any fear there are policemen in, in cubicles on every other corner or every corner. Uh, the, the area's been cleaned up. The restaurants are, are really nice. I, I just want to tell you, it was like a transformation in Mayor Giuliani from one citizen to a great mayor. I want to tell you, you've done an extraordinary job, and the people across this country ought to visit New York City. This is an unsolicited <laughs> testimonial to try to get you a little tourism. Now, you see, you've got some applause from one of your congressmen. <laughs> On our second panel, we will have State Attorney Harry Shorenstein, Shorstein of Jacksonville, Florida, and Police Commissioner John Timoney of Philadelphia. After serving in the Marine Corps in Vietnam, for which he was highly decorated, Mr. Shorstein returned to Florida where he gained experience as both a defense attorney and a prosecutor. He served as the division head in the Office of the Public Defender and subsequently as the division head and chief, as chief assistant state attorney. Mr. Shorstein has served as the elected state attorney for Jacksonville since 1991. Mr. Shorstein has received high praise for his juvenile justice reforms, which combine prevention with punishment and rehabilitation. Since the implementation of Mr. Shorstein's juvenile uh, justice strategy, juvenile crime in Jacksonville has plummeted. Murder is down 78 percent and vehicle theft is down 58 percent. According to a recent Florida State University study, Jacksonville's approach to juvenile crime under the leadership of Mr. Shorstein has averted more than 8,700 crimes between 1992 and 1995. Mr. Shorstein is a Democrat, but his approach to juvenile justice has enjoyed widespread bipartisan respect. He has earned the support of Jacksonville's Republican mayor, a Democrat sheriff, and the Jacksonville uh, City Council. He has briefed Democratic U.S. Senators at their 1998 Issues Conference and Republican U.S. Senators at their 1998 retreat. The juvenile justice model developed in Jacksonville by Mr. Shorstein deserves national attention. It has been featured on CBS's 60 Minutes, The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, and NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, among many others. Philadelphia Police Commissioner John Timoney will be joining Harry Shorstein on our second panel. Commissioner Timoney was born in Ireland. Won't be long till we'll all be Irish. is in St. Patrick's Day coming up here pretty quick. <laughs> he was born in Ireland and began his law enforcement career in 1969 as a rookie police officer in New York City. Commissioner Timoney rose through the ranks and was appointed first deputy, deputy commissioner on January 13, 1995 the second highest rank in the New York City Police Department. Commissioner Timoney was appointed police commissioner on March 9, 1998. 
in uh, Philadelphia. Although he's been a commissioner less than a year, there are already signs of his progress. Murders are down 19 percent, narcotics arrests are up 70 percent, and arrests overall are up 17 percent. One of Timoney's most innovative reforms, Operation Sunrise, an anti-drug initiative, has resulted in 2,363 arrests and the seizure of $1.9 million in drugs, 73 guns, and 122 vehicles. Commissioner Timoney is also implementing high-tech solutions to stalk criminals and reduce crime. Under his plan, police personnel put input timely, accurate crime data into a computer system linked through throughout Philadelphia. An analysis of the data through mapping techniques allows Commissioner Timoney to distribute his resources where they are most needed. He's recruited a former economics professor and British police science expert under Margaret Thatcher's government, Gordon Wasserman, to assist with his high-tech program. In the wake of, our, of, of the success our witnesses have experienced over the past few years, it's time to ask these questions. How has the federal government impacted your success in fighting crime? Has the federal government hindered your crime-fighting efforts, and if so, why? What future steps should we take to assist your crime-fighting efforts? Today's witnesses will help the committee answer these questions. The Congress needs to know when to help, how to help, and when to step out of the way. We need to be a partner with state and local governments, not a hindrance and not a nuisance. I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses to the committee. We're delighted you are here with us today, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. And with that, we'll start off with Mayor Giuliani. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, sir. Have a chance to make one opening statement. Oh, yes, sir. We'll be glad to. Uh, we'll uh, yield to uh, my colleague, Major Owens, for an opening statement. Uh, and uh, if any of my other colleagues would like to have an opening statement, we'll yield to them, too, Mr. Owens. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. I want to start by congratulating you, Mr. Mayor. As a fellow New Yorker, I applaud your leadership in lowering the crime rate in New York City. Every citizen, including my constituents in the 11th Congressional District, benefits from the comfort level achieved in neighborhoods over the past few years. We also benefit from the improvement in the city's image, which enhances our huge tourism industry and generates budget surpluses, which one day, since I also serve on the Education Committee here, one day I hope will be used to replace some of the 250 coal-burning furnaces in public schools, which pollute the schoolyard air and add to the children's asthma crisis that we have in the city. I also hope the surplus will be used from the tourism revenue will one day be used to build new schools and in the widespread practice in overcrowded schools, which forces students to eat lunch at 10 a.m. because the cafeteria can only function by feeding children in shifts. These are some of the problems that I think a surplus accumulated from our successful tourism industry should be dedicated to. What I'm saying, Mr. Mayor, is that the stakes are high for all of us. When law and order are pursued with a respect for civil rights and justice, we all benefit. However, when a preoccupation with a scorecard on crime drives the crime-fighting effort to the point of diminishing returns, then all of those benefits face the danger of sudden evaporation. One or two massive riots in any large city could overnight greatly alter the image of that city. One immediate consequence would be, a would be a drastic decline in revenue from a much needed tourism industry. The greatest consequence, however, of such an urban upheaval would be the damage done to the psyche of its citizens and the poisoning of relations among its diverse groups. My hope here is that New York City has maximized its short-term benefits from, from reduced crime. My understanding is, and we, we all applaud that, however, we face a loss of these benefits over the long haul because your administration now seems to have an obsessive preoccupation with a quest for some imaginary trophy to be awarded to the number one crime fighter in the nation. The casualty of this obsession is civil rights and justice in New York City. There are immediate dangers looming, and the tips of the icebergs are clearly visible in the series of unjust police atrocities that have occurred over the last two years. The recent shooting of Amadou Diallo has moved the city closer to a negative climax that could be very harmful. The cases of Diallo and Abner Luima are well known. However, within the neighborhoods where citizens feel they are targeted, the accounts of serious police abuses are endless. Within my district, the accounts are endless. First, people feel that there's a strangeness there that around the, surrounding the fact that police killings and 
police atrocities of any kind never occur with white victims in white neighborhoods. The victims are never white. This is 1999, not 1963, but those of us who were in positions of urban leadership in the 60s can now clearly see some unfortunate parallels. We should all read the Colonel Lindsay Commission, and it's called the Colonel Report user, but Mayor Lindsay, who was the mayor of New York City at that time, also was uh, co-chairman of that commission. That report talked about the alienation of large segments of the city's pop a city's population and how it creates what they call two societies and how the highly visible and dramatic police abuses in these situations always are the spark plugs which set off spontaneous violence and riots. Before the New York City model is offered to the nation, and I'm glad to see the positive features of that model offered to the nation, before that is done, however, I strongly urge that you examine its weaknesses in the areas of civil rights and justice for ordinary citizens in their day-to-day -day interaction with the police. The communal environment in our great city has been polluted with an extremism which must be checked immediately. I have attached a set of very familiar questions related to civilian review boards, special prosecutors for police abuse cases, and the nationwide practice of requiring residency for local police. These are logical, reasonable, common sense demands that you have heard often, and they are often repeated. They nevertheless, no matter how often repeated, still make good sense. It is imperative that these demands are addressed, will be addressed if long-term law and order benefits, if what we have now is to continue over long term, uh, is to be achieved and preserved in New York, New York City and in America in general. And I have here uh, five questions, and one of those questions asks for some statistics uh, uh, which relate to the perception of people in my district and neighborhoods like mine. Uh, they think that they are victims unnecessarily. So among these questions, which I hope you will get back to us with answers on to the committee, uh, uh, statistics on the number of parking tickets ridden by police precincts, so we can see which neighborhoods get the most parking tickets. The number of cars towed by the police, by precinct. Uh, the number of youth arrested, the number of prosecuted by precinct. The number of whites killed in New York City by the police, the number of non-whites killed. The amount of money paid by New York City in the settlement of police misconduct cases. The number of white youth in juvenile detention centers. Some of my constituents told me the other day that they work in juvenile detention centers and they've never seen a white youth there. Where do white youth who are in trouble uh, go in the city? And is that another, uh, another example of, of segregation and special treatment that uh, our youth are subjected to? So these are, these are pretty uh, common sense questions. Most of you heard, heard them uh, before. I think they're imperative if we're to go forward and realize over long term the benefits that have been gained by the re crime reduction on a short term. The population of the city must be an ally and not an enemy. Thank you, Ma Major Owens. We will, uh, we will get back to questions shortly, so some of those questions you ask can be answered. Uh, is there for, are there further discussion by members of the committee? Further comments on our side? Any on your side? Danny? Mr. Davis? No. Since I'm named Danny, sometimes I let it slip and use that first name first. I well, you know, we're so close together, Indiana and Illinois, until we do that. Okay, buddy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly would like to welcome and thank the witness, uh, New York Mayor Giuliani, State's Attorney Shorstein, and Commissioner Timothy, for taking time to share with us today and look forward to your comments and insight. It is my understanding that the panel in all probability will assert that the role of the federal government is not an appropriate one in much of the crime policy area. However, the approach to fighting crime is an issue that should not be overlooked. I maintain that an individual is innocent until proven guilty, and this should be kept in mind at all times. However, oftentimes civil liberties have been threatened at times by police misuse, abuse, and misconduct. I know that in my own hometown of Chicago, Illinois, we have had several cases of concern where it is evident that there is a deepening crisis of police community relations. Names like Jeremiah Meriday, Jorge Gillian, and Andrew Sled come to mind as only a few. I know that many times those in the African American and Latino communities are weighed down by the burdens of danger and fear. Our communities are visited with the plagues of crime and drugs. 
As we continuously struggle to overcome these plagues, we're further weighted down by an even more devastating epidemic of police brutality. This has caused a rising tide of disaffection and mistrust in our community justice system. Not only does police brutality directly threaten our life and safety, but it also destroys the trust and cooperation between community and police that is necessary if we are to effectively address the problems of crime and drugs and justice. We also need to address the issue of new controls on those who engage in police brutality and misconduct. In Chicago, for example, there are over 8,500 complaints filed of excessive force from 1993 to 1995 and almost three quarters of the cases were never resolved. The failure of current police procedures to address the issues of alleged police brutality have been documented well in community forums, hearings, and the newspapers. I'd like to submit, Mr. Chairman, some of these articles for the record. I also again want to thank the witnesses, indicate that we look forward to their testimony and I trust that at the end of the day, not only will we have gleaned information relative to our ability to fight crime and reduce criminal activities, but hopefully we can also find a way to create a more harmonious relationship between those whom we expect to enforce the law and those who must abide by it. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to your testimony, Mr. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank the gentleman, Mayor Giuliani. Welcome. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your statement. You might want to even allude to some of the questions that have been asked so far. We will have a question and answer session after your opening remarks, so Mayor Giuliani. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to discuss with you some of the things that are going on in New York City and how we can improve the relationship between city government, state government, local government, and uh, the federal government. As uh, I think you all know, New York City is uh, the nation's largest city. We're also the world's most diverse city. 100 languages or more are spoken in the city of New York. Every racial, religious, ethnic group and subgroup is represented in the city of New York, and it's a source of a lot of challenges, obviously, but of probably the greatest strength that the city has. That um, people of so many different backgrounds, so many different points of view, religions, cultures, join together in one place, and uh, it gives the city a vibrancy, it gives the city a culture, and um, it offers really a proving ground for solving human problems that's probably on a scale unmatched anywhere. Um, although, in many, many ways, New York City is very much like every other American city. It goes through the same sets of problems, the same sets of difficulties. The scale of our problems is sometimes larger. And sometimes when we have solutions, the scale of the solution has to necessarily be even larger. When I became mayor of New York City, I believed very, very strongly that the city of New York was in a tremendous uh, crisis. We had lost 320,000 jobs in a two and a half year period. That was the largest job loss we had since the Depression. A, um, if you looked at the city from the point of view of the way people looked at it from outside the city of New York, and many people shared that view inside, the city was thought of as the crime capital of America and the welfare capital of America. It was thought of as a place that was too frightening for people to come to, and it was thought of as a place that w did not offer enough people opportunity. I've tried very hard in the five and a half, six years that I've been mayor to turn that around. We began with crime. We began with crime because it was the most basic problem that we had to solve. Until people can feel reasonably secure about their well-being, then nothing else can work. Schools can't work. Businesses can't work. People want to leave. There was a poll taken in 1993, which is the year that I ran for mayor, in which about 70 to 75 percent of the people in the city said that if they had a choice, they'd rather live somewhere else. That represented the views of the poorest people, the richest people, the middle class people, roughly all shared that same view. Now, those numbers have roughly been reversed. 
That still means that there are 20 to 30 percent of the people that haven't felt the opportunity, haven't felt the change, still feel alienated, and it's our job, city government and all of ours, to reach them and to see if we can make them share in the turnaround that's taken place. But it is a substantial turnaround, and I'm going to focus on one or two aspects of it. We've talked about uh, crime. In the area of crime, uh, the city of New York really has had a great deal of success based upon many things. I'm going to emphasize three of them as things that can be replicated elsewhere, and much of which is being done elsewhere. It isn't just unique to the city of New York. The Comstad program, the broken windows theory, and drug enforcement. I believe that those are the three main reasons why crime is down as dramatically as it is. Uh, the Comstad program is a program of measuring crime every single day. We have 77 police precincts in New York City. Every single day, we gather all of the crime statistics from each one of those precincts. They go into a computer program, and then on a weekly, monthly, regular basis, they can be analyzed so we can determine if crime is going up or crime is going down, and if it's going up, why and what has to be done about it. It allows for two things to happen. It allows for very, very intense strategic planning to take place so that in a city as large as New York, seven and a half million people, sometimes as many as two or three million visitors, you can focus on where the increase in car theft is taking place, where the increase in mugging is taking place, where the increase in rapes are taking place. And then you can develop strategies for reducing it before it becomes a major problem. In the past, crime statistics were used after the fact. We looked at crime statistics a year after the crimes actually took place. Now we look at the crime statistics essentially the day after the crime takes place so that we don't let crime get out of control and so that we can bring about crime reductions. That's played a very, very large part in the crime reductions that have taken place. The second is the broken windows theory, which simply means that you cannot allow things to fester for long periods of time that you might regard as small things. Senator Moynihan described this in 1993 with a phrase that always stuck in my mind. He gave a speech in the city of New York at a time in which we were averaging 2,000 murders a year, uh, which had become records even for the city of New York. And he said that we were engaged in a process of defining deviancy down. What he meant by that was we were looking at deteriorating standards of human behavior, graffiti, street-level prostitution, street-level drug dealing, uh, aggressive behavior on the street, and we were ignoring it because we felt we had no capacity to deal with it, that we had more important problems to deal with. So we were finding excuses and, rash and rationalizations for deteriorating standards of behavior. He called it defining deviancy down. It seemed to me when I listened to that, and I was planning to run for mayor then, that we had, we had a, essentially just re reversed the ship. <laughs> Rather than defining deviancy down, we should set higher standards. And we should continually try to ask people to act better, to act better toward each other, to be more civil. And if we did that, we would start to ultimately affect even the more serious crimes. Professor Wilson of Harvard and uh, later Northwestern and other universities wrote a book about this in about 25 years ago. He called it the broken windows theory. It meant if you have a building and somebody breaks a window and you say to yourself, I'm too busy with my business, I'm too busy with everything else to worry about that one broken window, it's very likely that in a short period of time, somebody will break another window and another window. Eventually, they'll break all the windows in your building, and your building will fall down because you thought that the first problem was so small, you didn't have to deal with it. On the other hand, if somebody breaks your window and you fix it right away, and you find the person who did it, and you make it clear to them that this is unacceptable behavior, that you can't destroy the property of other people, that this is an important thing, then you're probably going to save your whole building. And if you keep fixing those windows right away, eventually they'll get the point. So other cities had tried the broken windows theory before New York, smaller cities by and large, cities with populations of 100,000, 120, 150,000. In 1994, I put that theory in, in place in the largest city in, in America. I was faced every time we did it with tremendous cynicism as to whether it could work in New York.
New Yorkers love to say it can't work here. And the fact is it's worked better in New York now than in some of the smaller cities. And it means that we're improving our standard of behavior. If I could, I have some charts. If I could show you these things in charts, it may actually illustrate things even more effectively than uh, a lot of words. The first chart is a chart of the total FBI index crime complaints. And what it demonstrates is that in 1998, New York City had the lowest level of crime since the FBI started measuring crime. 1968 is the first year they began measuring it, and that crime decline represents about a 50% decline since the time that I've been in office. And 1998 was the safest year that New York City had since before 1968. The second one, which is maybe even more dramatic, because it's the area of crime that unfortunately you can measure the most accurately murders. New York City, as I said, was averaging about 2,000 murders a year in the early 1990s. In fact, we hadn't had a year with less than 1,000 murders at any time in the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Last year, we had 629 murders, which was the lowest number that we had since 1966. Uh, for example, Mr. Davis, and this is not meant in any way uh, to create a conflict with Chicago. I think you have a great mayor, and there are things you're doing in your city that I wish we were doing in our city, like the reform of the school system, which I think is a model for the rest of the country. But Chicago, which has half the population of New York City, had 700 murders last year, and that was a decline. New York City, which has double the population, had 629. So the city has established itself not only is the safest large city in America, but when you compare cities with populations of 100,000 or more, I believe we're now city number 167. So a city that was thought of as the crime capital is now seen as a place that has, to a large extent, become a much safer place. Crime statistics for a whole city, however, are hard to measure, and I think Mr. Owens made that point before. I think that You've got to look at individual neighborhoods. You, you almost have to look at individual blocks. The ComStat program that we have allows us to do that. Washington Heights, that's chart, Washington Heights in Brooklyn, in, in uh, Manhattan rather, uh, is an area that is, um, that is, that used to be the cocaine center for the city of New York and for much of the Northeast. I had the benefit before I was mayor of being United States attorney for five and a half years. So I guess maybe I had a preparation in understanding where the problems were. But this was a community that was at the center of the crack ep epidemic for much of the Northeast and much of America in the early 1980s. The crime rates in the 33rd and 34th precincts in Washington Heights were among the highest, and it was one of the areas of intense activity when I was the United States Attorney, including uh, an area in which we lost police officers uh, to drug dealers who slaughtered them in the line of duty. Uh, I'm very, very happy to report that uh, crime is down in Washington Heights by even more than in the rest of the city. Washington Heights has an 80 percent decline in murder. The city has a 70 percent decline in murder. In 1993, the year before I came into office, there were 75 people murdered in Washington Heights. Last year, there were 15. In my view, Mr. Owens, 15 too many, but a lot better than 75 of uh, 1993. And the same thing is true for overall crime decline. It's down 51%. It means the people in Washington Heights, and that is a multilingual, diverse community, now can live in a lot more freedom, a lot more liberty, can pursue their own opportunities, and uh, have a much, much different quality of life than they, have, uh, than they, than they had uh, back in 1993. One other community, which is in East New York, the 75th Precinct, which I know Mr. Owens knows well. I picked that precinct because I knew you were going to be here, and I wanted to show you the results in the, in the precinct, but also because in 1993, that precinct led the city in murders. It had 125 murders in that one police precinct in the city of New York. Last year, it had 41 for a decline of 67.2 percent, which is a major reduction in crime. And I thank God that as I talk to you now this year, there haven't been any, which um, we hope continues for the rest of the year. And there hasn't been a period of time in which there haven't been murders for this long in that precinct in something like 35 to 30, 36 years. And we hope that that continues. The point that Mr. Owens made before 
I also tried to take a look at on a citywide basis and on a local basis, and that is what's happening with the behavior of police officers. Are police officers becoming less restrained? Are they acting in an improper way? Are they using their weapons more, let's say, in order to produce for us these declines in crime? And I understand and, un understand and um, share the shock and horror at the terrible incidents that take place when police officers act improperly, when police officers act violently, when police officers act brutally. When I was a United States attorney, I not only prosecuted drug dealers and prosecuted organized criminals uh, during my time as an assistant United States attorney and United States attorney, I prosecuted many police officers and uh, police officers for corruption, police officers for brutality, police officers for acting in a criminal way and feel that they have to be held to a higher standard. But we can't allow the understandable emotions that emerge from a horrible incident to cloud reality and to cloud truth. And we can't allow perceptions, if they're false, to overwhelm truth. Otherwise, we are really not advancing society. The reality is, and I think this may come as a surprise to a lot of people, that the New York City Police Department, as it's reduced crime, has even by a greater extent reduced its own use of weapons, reduced its own use of force. The New York City Police Department, as it matches up with other police departments in this country, is one of the most restrained. In, um, in this city, for example, in Washington, D.C., and again, this is not meant at all because I understand all of the internal problems and some cities do one thing well and other cities do something else well. In this city, there is a six times, six times greater chance that you will be shot by a police officer per capita than in the city of New York. In the city of Dallas, there's like a four times greater chance. New York City is among the most restrained police departments in the country in the use of weapons and in the shooting of their guns. That doesn't mean that they can't make a mistake. That doesn't mean that some of them can't act criminally which is tragic and unfortunate. But it does mean when that does take place, much like if um, a terrible murder takes place in New York City today among, between and among civilians, I could, um, and we all could, feed into the impression that murder is running rampant in the city of New York. Or we can say to people, this is a tragic, awful thing. Justice should be brought to this situation. But the reality is that murder is down 70%. And whereas there used to be 125 murders here, there are now only 15. Or when the reality is there have been 75, there are now only 25. So I hope that, that offers some other way of looking at this because it's enormously important where if we're gonna have reality square with perception rather than having false perceptions rule us. Let me see if I can give you some of the reality of what's taken place in the last four or five years. While citywide arrests we could put that chart up. While citywide arrests have gone up to record highs, which is one of the ways in which we've also brought down crime, we arrest a lot of people, particularly drug dealers. Police, officer, police officers using their guns has decreased by 50%, by over 50%, almost 51%. And just to give you the actual numbers, back in 1993, there were 212 people who were shot intentionally by police officers in the city of New York. That was a time in which we had 10,000 fewer police officers. We now have 10,000 more police officers, and in 1998, there were only 111 people that were shot by the police. That's a per capita decline of 67%. So before people attack an entire police department and make it appear as if they are bringing about this level of record safety by shooting wildly, the reality is just the opposite. They have reduced dramatically, even more than they've reduced crime, the use of their weapons, the times that they shoot, and the times that they use violence uh, with regard to affecting arrests. Can they do better? Yes. Should we avoid all of these incidents if we can? Yes, we should. And are we trying to do that? The answer to that is also yes. The CompStat program that I mentioned to you that measures crime in every precinct of the city based on based on an innovation of Police Commissioner Safer of a year and a half ago, now measures all civilian complaints, all reports of abuse. So when a precinct commander comes into the police department every two or three months and is being evaluated in the 75th precinct, for example, 
with regard to what's happening to murders, what's happening to rapes. Are there more car thefts? Are there problems that the community is having from the point of view of crime? One of the things that is featured in that review is, have your civilian complaints gone up or down? Have your allegations of use of force gone up or down? If they have gone up, what are you doing about it? Is it a particular officer is causing the problem? Is it a group of officers? So I think the reduction in the use of force by police officers, which is dramatic, comes about from deliberate policies that are intended uh, to accomplish that. And I'd be happy to answer any more or additional questions uh, about that. I'd like to touch on quickly two other areas other than crime, because I think it illustrates the ways in which we can cooperate uh, together. One is welfare reform that you mentioned before, uh, Mr. Chairman, and then the other is uh, the area of, t of taxes. In the area of welfare reform, we have reduced the number of people on welfare by about 460, 470,000 people since 1995. We began our welfare reform program about a year and a half before the federal welfare reform bill passed, uh, uh, passed and the president eventually signed it. It has been enor enormously successful. And what we are doing is trying to substitute work for welfare every place that we can and in every way that we can. And if I could urge on you and on the members of Congress, both with regard to crime reform and welfare reform, the maximum degree of flexibility that you give us is by far and without any doubt the best way to allow us to accomplish the reductions and the changes that are taking place. Our welfare offices by August of this year will all become job centers. Instead of a sign that used to be on the door that said welfare office, actually the sign used to say income support center. We're changing all the signs and we're putting up a sign that says job center. But it's more than just a sign. The purpose of that sign is to turn the people inside that office into employment counselors. And when you walk into a welfare office now in New York City and you ask for welfare, out of compassion, understanding, and a much, much higher form of wisdom, we ask you, what kind of job would you like? What have you done? What's your work history? If you have a work history, we try to follow up that work history with finding you a job in the area in which you have a work history. If you don't have a work history, we try to create one for you so that you begin to have a work history, because that's the only way in which you're going to get a job. And we are, to the largest extent possible, trying to turn our welfare offices into employment offices. The change has been dramatic. Uh, the welfare numbers are down below 700,000 since the first time since the 1960s. We went to a million people on welfare in 1970 and virtually stayed there forever. But the most dramatic change is one that I can't measure for you, and I would invite you to come and see it. I'd invite you to come to the job centers, take a visit, have them take you around and talk to the people who work for the city of New York and the job centers now, the people who work for our Human Resources Administration. And what you will find is that they now have a very, very positive, very refreshing outlook about their work, which used to be very depressing work five or six years ago. Just registering more and more people for welfare doesn't give you a sense of accomplishment. It gives you a sense of helping, but it doesn't give you a sense of accomplishment. Finding jobs for people, having competitions between job centers that used to be welfare offices over who can find more jobs and who can find them more quickly and which jobs are the most lasting creates a real sense of a positive attitude, you're really helping someone. And I think this is something in which we need to make further refinements because a, a lot of the regulations that used to exist in the federal agencies that administer welfare have not been changed, even though you change the law. And they still impose enormous mandates on us, enormous burdens that shouldn't exist, and tremendous contradictions between the prior philosophy which was largely to encourage people to be on welfare, and the present philosophy, which is welfare should exist, it should be there, it should help people who need help, but our first endeavor should be to have people help themselves, that we should, in essence, fight hard to keep people from dropping out of the workforce, because if we do that, we give people a chance to take care of themselves. And although you change the law and the reform is taking place, some of the federal agencies have not changed the regulations. So that creates a real problem, I think, not only for New York City, but for a lot of communities in the city. And I'll, I'll reserve my comments on taxes 
and some of the uh, further comments that I have on some of the questions that came up uh, from you and uh, from Mr. Owens and uh, until later when we get to the questions and answers. But thank you very, very much for this opportunity to address these, these issues. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I, uh, I just hope that everybody in America uh, gets a chance to go to New York and see firsthand the fantastic results that have been achieved under your administration. I do not want you to take conventions away from Indianapolis, but at the same time, uh, I do think people ought to be aware of what, uh, what you've been able to accomplish because it's really sensational. I, I cannot tell you my family and I were there visiting along with some of our friends and uh, we had always heard that you couldn't be safe in downtown Manhattan. You get around Broadway, the, the porno shops and everything, you had to be very, very careful. And it was just the opposite. Uh, there was a policeman on every corner. They were courteous. Uh, we didn't feel any danger whatsoever. And uh, I, I was just amazed. I didn't think things could change that much. So here to well, be con congratulated. Come, but come I, often and spend a lot of money. Yeah, spend a lot of money. I don't have a lot of money, but I will come often if I get it. Whatever chance. you can spend, we appreciate it. All right. <laughs> I do have a few questions I'd like to ask, however. Uh, <clears throat> you said that. Uh, you had 320,000 jobs lost in a two-year period, and that's been completely reversed since you, uh, your administration took office. Briefly, could you tell us how, how you did that? The, uh, the turnaround in jobs, which I have in front of me here, is really based on many factors. I think the crime reduction has a lot to do with that. I think we, we were losing jobs because people were afraid to put their business in the city of New York or they were leaving the city because they were afraid. I also think we had a, um, a tax policy that was destroying the private sector. So one of the things that I began doing in 1994 at a modest level and then increased dramatically as the city's fiscal health improved was tax reduction. I reduced taxes by $34 million the first year, $200 million the second year, and now, now the tax reductions are at $2.4 billion. So, so, so we so put money back into the private sector. The hotel occupancy tax is the best example of about 10 examples. We had a hotel occupancy tax that was the highest in the country. We were, in fact, losing all of our conventions, not only to Indianapolis, but to every city in the country, because nobody wanted to pay our hotel occupancy tax. In the first year that I was in office, I persuaded the city council and the state legislature to cut it by 33%. And now we, we collect about 70 to $80 million more from the much reduced hotel occupancy tax than we used to from the higher one. You, you know, I, I, and jobs are up dramatically in hotels and restaurants by about 20%. Well, that's a point that I hope everybody gets very clearly across this country. When Ronald Reagan cut taxes in the early 80s, we were bringing in about $500 billion in tax revenues annually. And all I heard around here was, my guy said it's going to cause the depletion of our tax revenues. But because it stimulated economic growth, we more than tr almost tripled the amount of tax revenues in three years. It went mm -hmm. to $1.3 trillion from $500 billion. And you make the same case. When you cut the taxes, you brought more industry and business into New York City, and therefore you brought in more tax revenues because there were more people producing taxes. One of the things that we are trying to do now is to eliminate the sales tax in the city of New York. And we've persuaded the state legislature to eliminate it on clothing purchases of $110 or less, which will help the citizens in the city who are the poorest because you, you it's just... a big burden on them. But eliminating the sales tax on clothing would be the best jobs program that we could possibly create, much healthier than the jobs programs that used to come out of Congress and that used to be forced on cities and states that I used to investigate as a United States attorney and put people in jail for defrauding. And a jobs program that says no sales tax in the city of New York means 20,000 more jobs, 25,000 more jobs in department stores, retail stores, outlets, and those are good entry level jobs when you're going through a welfare to work uh, change in, in New York City or in America. So it, it, tax reduction can help and can be the be most effective form of a jobs program. You, you just had a moratorium for one or two days, didn't you, on sales <laughs> yeah. taxes in New we York? We had a moratorium as part of the effort to convince the state legislature to eliminate the sales tax on clothing purchases. We did four pilot uh, programs, four weeks over a two-year period 
in which we eliminated the sales tax or we eliminated it at a certain threshold level. And in those weeks, sales increased from 50 to 250 percent in our stores. And the main reason that I want to do it is in order to produce more jobs. If a store could count on an increase of 10, 15, 25 percent more in revenues, it can hire more people. And therefore, the transition we're going through, 450,000 fewer people on welfare, a growth of 300,000 private sector jobs during that same period, we could, we could match the reduction in welfare with the growth in jobs. So by reducing the sales tax during that brief period, you increased from one to five fold the amount of people that were buying products. Absolutely. In, 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 and, in that or, and that offered the, it was a very hard sell for a lot of reasons internal to the politics of New York City, which is that not all areas of the state can reduce the sales tax or eliminate it. But we at least got uh, the elimination of the sales tax on clothing purchases of $110 or less. What we're trying to get is just do away with it completely on clothing, and we could see a big jump in employment. I see my time's running out. Let me, let me just get back to the issue we wanted to talk to you about in general, and that was crime. What, what can we do at the federal level in Congress to assist you in helping continue to bring down those crime rates and those crime statistics in, in New York City? The, the more of what you do in the area of uh, block granting and discretion given to local communities, the, the better. Uh, when you did the crime bill, you made a change that was very important to the city of New York. You allowed us to include civilians in the hiring of police officers. That was enormously important to us because we had a lot of police officers, but we needed civilians. That kind of flexibility is important. And the more often you can do block grants, uh, the better off we're going to be. Probably the area where the federal government could help the most and where there's the greatest lack is in the area of drug enforcement, both from the point of view of using our authority through foreign policy and our ability to persuade much more effectively than we have, and in the area of border enforcement, assistance in terms of drug enforcement all throughout the country. That's an area where I don't think the same emphasis has been there uh, that used to be there, particularly with making it a major priority of our foreign policy. The State Department should be talking about drug enforcement and agreements with countries about reducing the crops and the transshipment countries cooperating with us. They should be talking about that as much as they're talking about international trade, border disputes, because it's as important to our future and, for, and to our children's future as any of the other things that, uh, that we're engaged in. And after all, foreign policy is the art of trying to enforce what is needed for your country into the policies and programs of other countries through persuasion, if you can, through more than that, if you have to. Mr. Owens. As Mr. Chairman, to stay on the high road, uh, let's all recognize that tourism is one of those areas where we get back some of that tremendous amount of money that flows overseas to foreign countries. And we'd like to see more of our money flow back to this country via tourists visiting. And we'll make a deal with you and recommend all the foreign tourists coming in their second stop be in Annapolis if you want, want a deal. Uh, How about 50-50? We'll take <laughs> half, you take half. The, uh, it's important that we understand that our big cities are the play, primary places the tourists go. They, they are major features of American culture. I'd like to see our big cities survive. I'd like to see our big cities thrive. I'd like to see the experiments and diversity succeed and, and get good results. And for, that's the dialogue reason I want to engage in uh, this dialogue with you, Mr. Mayor, because we have a problem in terms of perception, you know, uh, when I perceive smoke, there's fire somewhere. The reality is that there's fire, there's fire somewhere. Uh, we ought to take perceptions into consideration, knowing full well that they don't really reflect reality necessarily. But uh, the perceptions are important. Per uh, dealing with perception and dealing with what may be over-exaggerations based on highly visible, atrocious cases when someone is shot down with 41 bullets fired uh, you know, it, it sets off a chain reaction of emotions that's hard to contain. Uh, would it cost much for the city to have a safety valve through a, an effective civilian review board? This is not anything new. You've heard this proposition many times, and mayors before you have heard it many times. 
a civilian review board, which is effective because the people feel it, it's really going to reflect the decisions of the civilians. If you don't have it, a veto by the police commissioner, which you know abrogates the whole thing. You know, no, nobody has the faith in a civilian review board that has a veto by the police commissioner, or that has its budget greatly reduced, or it's a bit ridiculed by the mayor. So, uh, a low-cost uh, remedy for perceptions that may get out of control, it seems to me, would be a civilian review board. Or the appointment of a special prosecutor. It's just common sense to say that district attorneys work with police every day. The likelihood that they are going to be objective in the prosecution of police is nil. I mean, as hard as they may try. Uh, our former colleague here, Elizabeth Holtzman, was district attorney of Brooklyn. She set up a special unit to investigate police brutality cases, and they put 5,000 policemen around her office the next day. The police demonstrated 5,000 around her office to give you a visible uh, mock-up of what that kind of intimidation could be like. So special prosecutors for these cases seems to me a reasonable remedy. And we've been asking for this for the last 25 years. Let's have a dialogue and move on with it. The residency requirement. Now, towns and cities across the nation have residency requirements. In New York State, there are residency requirements in many counties and cities. But New York State legislature discriminates against New York City and will not let them have home rule and, and impose a residency requirement where you reduce the likelihood, or you greatly help the situation by having more police who live in the cities, live in the neighborhoods, and are not suspected by the population of treating them with contempt because they come from outside, they make all kinds of remarks, they, they really don't know in many cases uh, uh, the, the culture, et cetera. I think three of the policemen in the Abadou Dualo shooting were from out, outside of the city. It strikes me as strange that also they were mostly young people the oldest was 27th, and they have, sort of have life and death uh, uh, decision-making over people in the streets, and it's a very young crew, inexperienced. One of them came from the New York, uh, East New York precinct that you just mentioned, and he, he, he shot uh, a young man uh, out there, and that young man had been uh, uh, allowed to bleed to death. And he, he had no life-threatening wound, but they didn't treat him right away, so he bled to death. So, uh, all of these facts examined by the public, it adds up to a certain set of perceptions that are very serious. So could we not deal with that? And then I asked for some statistics uh, that you might present, provide us with. And obviously, you have the statistics so, uh, by precinct. So people who complain that we are getting more parking tickets in our neighborhood than they are in other places. In other parts of the city, they allow to double park, and nobody ever gives them a ticket. But we are riddled, you know, we, we have all these tickets. The number of cars towed away as people try to meet, reach their quotas and cars towed away and create more revenue for the city is greater in our neighborhoods than they are. The number of youth arrested and hassled on the street corners are, are greater, et cetera. And some of the other questions, I'll, I'll submit them to you. And then most of all, the question of, you must, you must deal with the fact that it is a fact that whites are almost never the victims of police brutality or certainly police killings. We have very few records of whites being victims. And that creates a perception which you have to deal with also. Deal with oh, that was a lot to deal with in one time, but I'll try. And, and I'll, I'll submit answers. I'll submit, submit answers Mr. to Mayor, if, if, the you, one, if you need more time when the light goes out, go ahead and finish. <laughs> the, first thing, the first thing I can assure you, although I, this I do not have the statistics on, is that people throughout the city of New York feel they get too many parking tickets. I, I get that complaint. I do a radio show every week between 11 and 11.45 on WABC, local station in New York. And one thing that can be, um, can be said is fair, impartial, equitable, and across the board is we give out a lot of tickets all over the place. And they all blame it, and they all, they all blame it on the mayor. Every community, ethnic, religious, racial of all different kinds and mixed, complain about parking tickets. Uh, but I don't, honestly don't know, I've never looked at, I get so many complaints about it, I just sort of have an intuitive feeling that that goes on. They do collect statistics by precinct. Oh, right? sure, I can get them, I'll get that for you. Uh, let, let me take up a few, a few of the things that, that, um, that you mentioned. First of all, the percentage of uh, police shootings. And, uh, oh, and uh, we've gone back to 1991 to 1998. But I, I can assure you, and I'll submit the statistics to you, that it pretty much breaks out about the same every single year. Over the last, over the last seven years, when there's been a police fatality, a police shooting that ended up in a fatality, 
about 50% of the victims have been black, about 13% have been white, about 36% Hispanic, and about 1% Asian. Now, when you look at shootings in society, in other words, what's going on in New York City, that is almost exactly the same as the percentage of shootings that take place in the population. Over that same period of time, 49.5% of the people who were murdered in New York City were black, 35% were Hispanic, and 11.6% were white, and 2.5% were Asian. And the reality is that as a percentage, police officers slightly more actually shoot white people or, than they are shot in society. If you understand what I'm saying, I'll give you the chart. Then if you look at people arrested for murder, 54.5% arrested for murder between 1991 and 1998 were black, 35% were Hispanic, 7.5 were white, 2.6 were Asian, and 5% are unknown. And that spans the administration of two different mayors, Mayor Dinkins and myself. So when you, when you try to take a look at police officer shootings, you say to yourself, well, are police officers shooting blacks in a higher percentage than the shootings are taking place throughout the entire city? The answer is no, it's about exactly the same. And well, the stick I asked for was the accidental shootings, not, not criminal cases yeah, it's, where it's, you pinpoint the, th it these, the chase these, and it's criminal. Can, I'll submit this all to you, but I can assure you these numbers work out about the same. And if you look at the raw numbers, that means that from 1991 to 1998, police officers in fatal shootings shot 100 blacks, and, but 5,553 blacks were the victims of murder during that period of time. And that b both works out to about 50%. So it, it doesn't look like police officers are shooting blacks over a seven year period in a higher percentage than it's happening in society. The only difference is police, office sh uh, police officer shootings of anyone, blacks or anybody else, are infinitesimal in comparison to the number of times that somebody else in society murders them. 5,553 blacks were murdered in New York City, 100 were fatally wounded by the police. That's a very big difference. You're mixing criminal cases with accidental shootings of victims like Amadou Diallo, Actually, then Eleanor the Bumpers, and people who obviously percentage, you know, were not criminals. Percentage uh, goes down even more dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. It goes Mr. in the other direction. Let me interrupt just a second, Mr. Majors. We'll, we'll have a second round of questioning if the, you'd like to have it, uh, but why don't we let him continue? On the Civilian the Review Board, uh, we do have a Civilian Review Board. I've increased its budget over the last two, two and a half years. I've increased the number of investigators that it has. And not only that, I, we just added 13 senior investigators to the Civilian Review Board so that we could have a much higher level of investigatory talent there. They are disposing of their cases about three times as fast as they have in the past. And the number of civilian complaints in the city is nowhere near the all-time highs that we used to have in the mid-80s of 6,000 and 7,000. And between 1996 and 97, which is the last statistics that I had, they actually went down 13%. So I think the Civilian Review Board, which is civilian controlled, not police controlled, independent, um, is doing its job more effectively than it has in the past. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree that they should ultimately, however, have the disciplinary authority. I think they can make the recommendations think you're going to destroy a police department if you take the disciplinary authority away from the police commissioner. And this co police commissioner, police commissioner Safer, and prior police commissioners in New York City have not been unwilling to dismiss police officers. We had a very tragic, unjustified killing in New York City by a police officer named Lavodi. And he was acquitted, you might remember, by a, jur by, by a, by a court in the Bronx. He was dismissed by the police commission. So the police commissioner has shown that he can, he's dismissed many, many people on civilian complaints that turn out to be justified. Then when you ask me about residency, I agree with you that the police department of New York City should be representative of the city of New York. It is better that it be representative. We have done everything within the law to allow us to do. We've done things that my predecessors didn't do. Uh, the first year that I was in office, the present police commissioner, who was then the fire commissioner, gave five extra points to people who live in the city of New York for taking the exam. 
and for taking them into the police department. We increased the residency. We increased the percentage of residents. The only thing I have to tell you, and this was reflected in an article in the New York Times this week, there is no connection at all between police misconduct and residency. When we look at police complaints, and this, this I find, according to the Times article, is, is true of police departments throughout the country. There is no connection between residency and police officers acting properly. And in fact, for some reason that I can't quite explain, when we look at police complaints, we actually get more civilian complaints against resident police officers than we do against non-resident police officers by about, by about 10 percent. So I don't know, even if we achieve residency, this, this is really the answer to a police department being more courteous and more respectful, either in New York or in the other cities that appear to have the same experience. Mr. Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like unanimous consent to put uh, three pages in the record here. Uh, Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Two of these are resolutions of the National Association of Counties Board of Directors and appropriate committees. One concerns resolution on early childhood development programs, such as establishing a flexible federal program that allows counties and states to develop home visitation programs for children and their families, including prenatal care. And there's a whole series of other worthwhile things. The second resolution is the resolution on services for emancipating foster youth. And among things, it would be permitting the states and cities to extend Medicaid to children up to age 22 who were in foster care but left the system at age 18 and to youths who were in assisted adoptions. This is a predicate to a book review that appeared in the New York Times uh, back in uh, May 10th, 1998. Uh, headed Thugs in Bassinets and the book Ghosts from the Nursery, Tracing the Roots of Violence. It's a fascinating book in terms of what's affecting young people in the first few months through three in a neurological sense of absolutely having no objection to violent behavior and what needs to be done in the school system, in the health system, in our cities, in our rural areas is to work with that type of child. And uh, I want to just put that in the record and uh, ask then another question, which I have an interest in this since I was a small person. Uh, my mother was welfare director of the county for 25 years. She was also a probation officer for five years, and she was head of the superintendent of the county hospital for a number of years. And so I grew up with these problems. And it's rather fascinating what's happened in America we have a lot of very well-meaning people that try to help young people, but some of this is without question psychological in terms of the behavior of the completely amoral behavior of young people in killing each other and not having one sign of remorse. And that leads me to another question which I have long advocated as an educator, and that is that the neighborhood schools should not just relate to education but also to the city's or the county's health services, to the city or county recreation services, so we could get one-stop service for both the children and the parents. And I agree with you completely in praising the mayor of Chicago. He deserves great praise. I think the major mayors of our cities and the major county executives ought to have the education programs under them. Now, in 1975, when I was vice chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, we went to New York, held one week of hearings on the school system. Uh, three of us were university presidents at the time, Father Hesburgh as chairman, myself as vice chairman, and Maurice Mitchell of uh, the University of Denver. And we were shocked to learn that in about the 1890s, the state of New York had, in its wisdom, put a merit board over the hiring of various teachers in the New York schools and various administrators. And I understand that. I'm half Irish, and I know that a lot of my Irish ancestors barely went beyond the third grade, and I guess in New York they were able to teach the sixth grade for never having gone beyond the third grade. So the state moved in and wanted meritocracy. Well, that was all very well, but when you look at the assistant principal test, none of the three college presidents on the commission could even get 50 percent of the answers. They might as well have been students of physics and chemistry. It had nothing to do with the job they are doing, which is mostly the disciplinary job and the counseling of younger people. 
And I don't know if that law is still on the books and that New York has freedom in that that they didn't have before. That was a state merit board put over the school system. So uh, I'd just like to know your reaction to the role of the mayor in education, getting those services in one place, and have you any thoughts on the dealing with the violence that is in some use, uh, youth from uh, bassinet on? Well, Mr. Horn, uh, I believe that law was repealed. Okay. The, the yeah, merit, we criticized the it. Uh, the fact is that in New York, what, what we what the mayor does not control the educational system. And that's, not, that's true not only for New York City, but all of the big cities in New York and most of the cities in the country. And it's a very, very big mistake. And the changes that have occurred in Chicago are the best example of what could happen. I have two votes on a board of seven and can be outvoted at any time, you know, four to, four to three, five to two, and therefore have some indirect influence but not the kind of control that you would have over a police department or a welfare system or a fire department or, and you can't make the changes that you would, that you would like to make. You can't make sure in the way that you would absolutely like to that the money is actually getting to the schools and to the classrooms. I've tried innovative ways to do that, which maybe produce half the results you could have if you really had control. And I, I'm sorry that Mr. Mr. Um, Owens left because I wanted to describe to him, he was talking about how we don't have enough schools and we haven't built enough schools. Since I've been mayor, we've actually added 95,000 seats to the school system, which is the largest increase since the baby boom. I inherited a deficit of 78,000 seats. In other words, there were 78,000 uh, places in which we had new students, but we didn't have seats for them. And we've rectified some of that, not all of it. I could have done it a lot faster if I had control of the, of the school system. And now when I put money into the school system, and I've increased the budget dramatically of the school system, but now when I put money in, I try to tie it to performance-based measures. We put $120 million more into what I call Project READ. They, in order to get that money, you have to give 10 to 12 hours more of reading instruction to students. We've had 133,000 students go through it. Their reading scores have gone up by 60%. We are specifically restoring arts education to the public schools. Great. So when I put money into it, it has to be in return for an arts program going in. We've now done that in 835 schools, and we're way ahead of schedule in doing that. But I have to almost set up like a review committee every time we do something, because I have to make sure that the, that the additional 100 million or 200 million has actually gone into the school system. I'm fortunate to have a chancellor, Rudy Crew who I think is the best in the country and is willing to take on the educational bureaucracy in aid of the, ch of the children. The biggest problem that we face, however, is principal tenure. The chancellor and the superintendents who oversee the school system are all based on contracts that are performance-based. However, they run a system that's a job protection system. You cannot remove a principal who has tenure no matter how bad the school performs, no matter how many kids drop out, no matter how many kids don't graduate, the principal is there for life, cannot be touched. And what I, what I maintain is that politicians who debate education have to stand on one side of the line or the other. Either you're in favor of a job protection system or you're in favor of a school system, and it's about educating children. And that's a major debate we're having in New York. Governor Pataki is a very strong supporter of ending principal tenure. But there's an awful lot of resistance to it. And you can imagine you know, where it comes from, which is the supporters of the status quo in education. Thank you. We'll pursue that in our second round on a number of other issues. Ms. Ms. Morella. Mayor Giuliani, it's Excuse a me, pleasure. Excuse me, I didn't see Mr. I, Davis right, down there. Pardon me. Thank you. You're, you're jumping over me, Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I must mm -hmm. be getting myopic. The gentlelady will be recognized in you, Danny, after we recognize Ms. Morella. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it right. is a uh, great privilege to welcome the mayor from the great city of New York, who has done a great deal to improve the safety of the residents of New York City. Um, I might add, combined with federal policies that banned assault weapons, passed the Brady Bill, helped get guns off the street, yet sent over $800 million to the city of New York to hire uh, more police officers and and uh, augment the, the, the uh, 
the police department's efforts, and we now have, I understand, a 24-year low in, in crime in the city of New York. And I am uh, very pleased with that. But I am uh, sure that you agree that a, that a local police force, in order to be successful, must enjoy the uh, trust and respect from the community they serve. And the recent uh, tragedy has uh, uh, seriously damaged uh, that trust. I am sure that all New Yorkers uh, share your, your deep concern over the tragedy, over the shooting of a 22-year-old who was shot 41 times by four police officers. But the main uh, problem here is that we, we have a serious problem, and what are we going to do about it? And I am, I am sure, Mr. Mayor, that, that uh, even though the number of police shootings have decreased in recent years, as you pointed out with statistics, but I'm sure you agree that uh, the problem and is beyond simple numbers. It's, it's a problem now of, of, of broken trust uh, by many of New York City's minority residents a, a, a trust that they feel, a distrust that they feel uh, towards the police department. And I am uh, really puzzled by, by the fact that you downplayed recommendations made by your own task force on police community relations. And Mr. Mayor, how do you respond to the fears of many of New York's minority residents that as the New York Times stated, uh, people are, and I quote, are frisked on the basis of race, end quote. And, and what do you plan to do about restoring that trust, uh, about uh, alleviating uh, those fears? And I specifically would like to hear how you plan to respond to your own task force recommendations. I know that you responded to roughly 61% of their ideas, but in the area of minority recruitment, expanding uh, the cadet corps, the police oversight board that was passed by the city council that was a stronger oversight board, which you vetoed. You then enacted a weaker CCRB, and you stated that it is funded, yet I've read, read some reports where it is underfunded uh, by $1 million. In the area of minority recruitment, the city is 60% minority, yet the police force is roughly 30%. And why haven't you responded to this really serious, um, obvious disparity before this tremendous tragedy? And I would like to ask you specifically about alleged selective responses to information requests by your police department Dominic Carter of New York One has alleged that uh, Mr. Sapphire will not respond to his requests on statistics, spe specifically the number of minorities on the street crime unit. If you could help get that number, uh, that would be helpful. And I, I uh, really uh, look forward to your comments. Welcome. I, I look forward to my answer. Uh, I think Dominic Carter should directly communicate with the police department rather than using me and you as the go-between for information for the media. So I would suggest that Dominic... He, he says he has. That. He says he has asked yeah, this number repeatedly. I really don't think it's the role of a member of Congress and the mayor to try to aid the media in getting information from the police department. So why don't, why don't we see if we can have him work with the police department to do that. I responded to the recommendation of the um, task force that I agreed with, and I put them into effect. I uh, disagreed with certain recommendations of the task force, and certain recommendations of the task force were entirely unrealistic, like uh, residency requirements. Residency requirements are set by the state of New York. They're set by the legislature of the state of New York. I can't change them. They've been in effect for 25 or 30 years. And the political reality is they're not going to be changed, because you would be asking legislators from outside of the city of New York to vote to get rid of jobs for their citizens. And I can't present them with a compelling case. I would be happy to present you with the same statistics that I gave to Mr. Owens. The reality is, you know, the, the difference between perception and reality, and the reason that we're all, we all pride ourselves 
on being educated human beings is that there are times in which perception is correct and there are times in which perception is incorrect. And do you serve an incorrect perception by just pandering to it or do you tell the truth about it? And it seems to me we expand all of our horizons when we react to the truth as opposed to pander to incorrect perceptions. The reality is, and the same New York Times that I believe you incorrectly quoted, and I'll go back to that in a moment that you cited, had an article this Sunday that pointed out that there is absolutely no connection between residency and proper behavior. And in our own statistics in the New York City Police Department, we actually have a higher percentage of resident police officers who have complaints that are filed against them. And that appears to be, according to the New York Times, the experience of just about every other city that has similar residency requirements. So you can't make out whether you like residency or you don't. Given the political realities of life that we live in, you can't make out a compelling case to do away with residency. But having said that, here's what we've done that you didn't mention in fairness to the work of the police department, my own work, and the work of the people who have tried to make a change here. We've done more to change residency than any prior administration. Mr. Mayor, my question was not about residency. The, the gentlelady's time has expired. Can we let the mayor finish because we're running short on time? You but asked me, my my you, question was not about residency. Oh, yes, it was. You asked me about the recommendations of the task force that I implemented and I did not implement. The major recommendation of the task force that I disagreed with and did not implement was a recommendation that I impose a residency requirement. So if you would like an answer to the question, the answer revolves a great deal around residency. The task force that you said I didn't implement their recommendations, one of the major recommendations that they made that I didn't implement was a residency recommendation. I, first of all, I can impose a residency. No, no, no. My question be... was minority recruitment, expanding the cadet corps, the police oversight board, and restoring okay. the trust. What are you doing to, dis to restore the trust between the minority community and the police department. Uh, but, I believe, but before the mayor answers, Ms. Maloney, your time has expired. Let the mayor conclude his answer because we have other members and the mayor is under time constraints. I think what we're doing to restore the trust of the minority community in New York City is precisely the same thing that we do for all communities in New York City. I don't have a separate agenda for the different communities of New York City. What we're doing to restore the trust of the minority communities in New York City is reducing murder in New York City by 70% so that in a community that had 125 murders last year. Uh, five years ago, there were only 15 murders last year and none this year. What we're doing to restore the trust of the minority community in New York City is having employment rates that are the highest in 20 to 25 years. What we're doing to restore the trust of the minority community is seeing national businesses go into Harlem and other areas of the minority community that wouldn't go there in 30 to 40 years because they were too afraid to put businesses there because crime was so high. Crime is down now, national businesses are investing. What we're doing in, for the minority community in New York City is funding the New York City public school system at the highest level that it's ever been funded, producing reading and math score improvements for the last five years. But we're doing that for the whole city of New York. What we're doing for the mi minority community is making a police department that has reduced crime more than any in the country become the most restrained in the country. Because over the same five years, something I didn't hear in all of the things that you said before, because the question is, are you feeding incorrect perceptions or are you creating correct perceptions? The correct perception is that the New York City Police Department in the last five years has actually a better record for restraint than it does crime reduction. It's rest more restrained by 67.2%. It's reduced crime by 50%. And when you compare your police department, the New York City Police Department, to the police department in just, a, any, every, just about every other major city in this country, the New York City Police Department is more restrained. So yes, there are times in which there are tragic circumstances, and then all of us in politics can do one of two things with those tragic circumstances. We can exploit them to feed misperceptions, or we can try to learn from them, put them in proper perspective, and explain to people that although this was a terrible thing that happened and the criminal justice system should answer it, we shouldn't use it to give people increased fears that they shouldn't have any different than if there was a terrible murder today in New York City among civilians, which happens 50 times more than any encounter with the police, that we would use that to give people the misperception that crime is not down because there was some terrible murder involving four or five civilians. So that's what we're trying to do, deal with people honestly in order to create a situation of real trust rather than pander to them.
Ms. Morello. Mr. Mr. Chairman, point uh, of personal privilege. Uh, we, we, we don't have the time to point, allow point. Point of personal privilege since it was alleged that I misquoted the New York Times uh, the, the to put the article in the, pay, in the record. I think that's uh, legitimate if someone legi alle alleges we'll put, that I misquoted we, I will allow the article you to put, put in the article in the paper without objection. To put it in the record. In I'll the put it in the record thank without you, objection. Ms. Morello. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Giuliani. We appreciate your passionate commitment to making <laughs> New York City the shining city on the hill. Uh, you know, I, the District of Columbia Committee is one of the subcommittees of this uh, government reform uh, committee, and we have been trying very hard to uh, revitalize the District of Columbia with, I think, a great element of success, looking to some of um, uh, the procedures and techniques that, and policies that you've employed the, um, the ComStat, the broken windows, establishing a culture of, of civility and cleanliness and anti-crime. I want to pick up on the crime theme, and then if I have time, go into the uh, job uh, income support um, uh, concept that you employ. Uh, I think throughout the country, crime ha violent crime has gone down. The difficulty is the age of the perpetrator has also gone down, and the age of the victim has also gone down. Now, in looking at your statistics, I don't know whether or not in the city you have compiled anything with regard to age and what that does show. It shows exactly that. Uh, probably uh, a little less dramatic than the rest of the country. Uh, the crime reductions in New York City have been about five times the national average. But there have been crime reductions throughout the country, crime reductions in New York. Our victims are getting younger. Our perpetrators are getting younger. But it isn't quite as dramatic as it is in the rest of the country. But we share the same the Then same we can problem. see an increased role in our society to begin to look at what is happening with our younger people and, and, and what their values are Question and what they're doing with their time. And you talked about increased flexibility for cities. I would imagine that you would give strong support to something like a, um, a youth development block grant that could bring big brothers, big sisters, uh, Boy Scouts, it, Girl Scouts, all of those groups together. Enormously valuable programs. We have many of them in New York City. Uh, we have um, Police Athletic League. We have the boys' clubs and the girls' clubs. We do a lot to support them. They are enormously valuable. We have a program called Beacon Schools. With which we've just expanded to 81 schools, in which we, I think Mr. Horn referred to something very much like it, in which we use the school as the community center. And the school remains open until 11 o'clock at night. The school is the place that not only the young people are educated, but the parents can come back for adult education, job training, language uh, assistance. You try to make this health, health services. You try to make the school the center of a community that needs rebuilding. And it is an enormously valuable program. It would, program it would be good to in, see a correlation between those programs. And we've, and and we've gotten money from the, uh, from the crime bill and other laws that you've passed that we've been able to use to expand those, those programs. And th those are areas that, that could be very, very fruitful collaborations. And we've been able to get the money more recently with not as many mandates attached to it as used to be the case before, because yeah. the fact is, this is true of every city in America. There's no one formula that works. And when you try to have a mandate, we then start using money in unwise ways just to get your money. The more flexibility you give us, give us money and say, use it to try to improve the opportunities for young people, we're going to be able to use that money a lot more wisely than if, than Which if is the federal a good government reason tries to for getting good people in, in, in local government to make sure they do use it wisely. With your income support, uh, plan. I, I believe in welfare reform, and it appears to be working, but I have some concerns about people being able to make livable salaries, to earn livable salaries. I have great concerns about child care. I have great concerns about medical care for the children. I, I don't know whether you'd like to comment on what you are doing to ameliorate that problem. We, um, New York City has an enormous uh, infrastructure of services for people. We have a hospital system, and in this way, we're unlike any other city. We own and operate 11 acute care hospitals and seven long-term hospitals. And anyone in New York City 
can get medical service for free. And they get, if, if no place else, in the public hospitals of the city, which account for about 23 to 25 percent of the hospital beds in the city. We have a vast array of services for young people, which we also provide in the schools. Most of our schools have health care facilities as well as public hospitals right in the neighborhood that can care for young people who do not have the ability to access hospital services. So um, we keep trying to expand it. How, how do you handle child care? It's so rightfully expensive and they don't we, seem to we, be We, put, all, we put a lot of money into our budget for, de for daycare. And when I said before that we require people on welfare to work, we don't require them to work unless we can help them find daycare. Uh, so that as part of the welfare to work program, we have invested hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in daycare so that if a, a woman comes in, wants welfare, has two children, they're, let's say, five and seven years old and needs um, daycare to help during the hours that the children are home from school, we will not require that woman to work unless we are able to provide the daycare for her. And at this point, we're able to do it. We're going to need more assistance, more money, when we start getting into further reductions in welfare. Up to this point, we've been able to afford it in our budget with the help of the state and the money that we get from the federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, let me again compliment you and all of New York City for your, your crime reduction activity and the ability to reduce crime. You also mentioned, though, that in the process of doing so, you've also reduced um, allegations of, 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 of misconduct or complaints against the police, that, that, that there's been a re reduction in, in the number of instances where overt action is alleged. Did you put into effect any additional training activities or how did you accomplish that? Well, the, the most dramatic and maybe the most reliable thing to look at are shooting, shooting incidents, fatalities, because they all have to be reported. There's a practice in New York City, which predates my administration. I'm not sure exactly when it began, but it probably is one of the most helpful in bringing those shooting incidents down to very, very low levels and lower than in most cities. Every single fatality, even if completely justifiable, goes before a grand jury, has to be investigated criminally. And every single shooting incident has to be investigated with a formal report of what happened, why it happened. So it's treated very, very uh, seriously. And that has probably helped a great deal. At the same time, we invest a lot of money in, tra in training. And we keep increasing it and, Im and improving it. And I mentioned before the ComStat program that we have. The ComStat program not only intricately measures crime in every single precinct in the city, on the same basis that we put emphasis on that, we look at the number of complaints in that precinct. So if, if we were reviewing the 75th precinct that we were looking at before, at the police department today, there'd be, there'd be an analysis of how many complaints have there been about police officers? How many complaints of use of force? We divide them into use of force or abusive behavior. And uh, if yeah. they're going up, then the precinct commander is expected to describe which police officers, is it a certain group of them? Are they being trained? Do they need retraining? Do they need discipline? And the commander is expected to present a picture in which we've got to see those things start going down. Otherwise, he or she is going to be removed. I think that's one of the ways. The other way that we did it is the Civilian Complaint Review Board that was mentioned earlier was very, very inefficient. And there are many reasons for that, including just the whole structure of it. It's a difficult process to start with. We've tried to improve it. We've put more people into it. We've hired more senior people. We've given them more resources. And they are doing their job better now. They're not doing it perfectly. They're never going to be able to do it perfectly, but I think they're doing it better now. Let me shift for a moment. Um, in the past, you've mentioned that the Department of Human Resources is going to develop a program 
where individuals who are known drug users and are also are on public assistance, where their benefits may be paid to a third party contractor. Yes. Could you tell me how that would work? With I can. It's a program that we're doing on a pilot basis right now with just a small number. The idea of it is we don't want the city, state, and federal government to be funding the, dr the drug trade. And therefore, if you are a drug addict and you want welfare, you've got to show us that you're doing something about your drug problem. And therefore, you've got to be going into treatment, serious treatment programs. You've got to be presenting us with a plan to do something about it. But if, we're, if we are going to be required to give you money and you're not doing anything about your drug problem, we don't want to indirectly be handing that money over to the local heroin dealer or cocaine dealer, which is what you're doing. So we will, we, what, what we will do is have a third party take over that money, make sure the money is spent on the children, is spent on, on food, is spent on the needs that the person has. But sure as heck, we don't want to be giving the money to an addict that then turns over 100 bucks or 200 bucks or 500 bucks to the local heroin dealer or organized crime. So that's the, the idea of it. We're also, it's part of a much bigger picture of trying to get much more intelligent, rigorous drug treatment programs than the unaccountable drug treatment programs. And here's an area where federal mandates absolutely hurt us. We are, the, and this is mostly the state of New York because they run our drug treatment programs, the city doesn't. We spend 60 to 70% of our drug treatment dollars keeping people addicted. We spend only 30% in drug-free programs. Methadone maintenance is the treatment of choice in New York City. And the reason it's the treatment of choice, just speaking very candidly with you, is the federal mandates give you more money more quickly, and large industries have developed handing out methadone to people because it's a lot easier saying, take your methadone than it is to put them into Phoenix House or Daytop Village or one of the places where you can have the possibility of drug freedom. Let me just ask, is this a court-ordered or court-sanctioned? I mean, the power of attorney, in effect, is, is what the individuals or the contractor receives over the person's money. No, it's, uh, it's something that you work out with the Human Resources Administration. Uh, it, it is part of a theory of the social contract, which is that if you, if, if you want benefits, then there are certain things that you owe society in return for those benefits. If you're not working and taking care of your own family and you're expecting everybody else to take care of your family, then we expect you to work as soon as you can. If you have a drug problem and that's the reason you're requiring the rest of society to support you, then you should be doing something about your drug problem. We shouldn't be sustaining your drug problem. The taxpayer shouldn't be sustaining your drug addiction for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And then when you, when you, when you multiply this out nationwide, the United States of America and the city of New York and the city of Chicago and elsewhere are supplying a lot of the funds for drug dealers. We don't do something about it, right? So that's the, really the attempt is to try to do something about it. And finally, we're, we're handing the welfare money to the drug addict, probably because the drug addict has two or three kids that have to be supported. But if the drug addict is using the, the welfare money to buy the heroin, the kids aren't getting supported. Yeah. So we, we want the money to go to the place that it would actually help people. That, that's Thank you very thing. much. And when you've generated enough data for a report, I'd... I'd, I'd On that one, I will be, I'd be happy to keep you informed. That, that's a new program, like the last two months, so I don't really have any. But I would be happy to keep you informed. Okay. Mr. Thank you very Mr. much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor, greeting to you. Uh, I congratulate you on the good work you've done in New York City. Uh, coming from Arkansas, uh, while I was U.S. Attorney, there were a number of uh, drug cases that we handled that originated uh, and had <laughs> suppliers in New York City. So uh, I'm delighted of the progress that you've made because it does impact a, a large part of our country. Uh, yesterday, I had an interesting debate at Georgetown uh, uh, Law School. Uh, concerning uh, mandatory minimum sentences with Judge Sporkin, who's been an outspoken critic of mandatory minimums. And I wanted to get your uh, feedback a little bit. I understand you all have had a uh, measure of success in, in New York City on uh, crack cocaine and uh, 
the street vendors in regards to that. And of course, uh, crack cocaine, you have a five gram uh, level for a mandatory minimum uh, for uh, uh, possession of crack cocaine in that amount. Uh, could you comment on your view of mandatory minimums and uh, the impact it's had uh, on crime in your city, both firearms and drugs, and specifically crack cocaine? Uh, mandatory minimum sentences, uh, I think, can be enormously helpful in creating a certainty of punishment if you're caught, which then has a much bigger deterrent impact than the uh, calculation that many criminals, particularly drug criminals, can make that, uh, number one, they can find a way to beat it, and number two, if they don't beat it, they can find a way to convince the judge or eventually the, de the Department of Parole or whatever to let them out of uh, prison in a very short period of time. I think it has very dramatic impact, particularly in the drug area, which, after all, is professional crime. I think you know this as well as I do. I mean, drug criminals know the criminal penalty process better than U.S. attorneys, assistant U.S. attorneys, or lawyers. I mean, they have it memorized because it's their business. We used to have drug dealers in New York City that would know precisely the levels at which you could plead and how much drugs you had to have in your pocket. And then they would go back and replenish it. So, but if they got caught, they could always claim to be a low-level drug dealer. But in a given day, they would be selling five times as much, but they would never appear to be doing that. So. Having these mandatory minimums, which convinces someone that you're really going to have to do actual time, and it's going to be five years or 10 years, I think can be very, 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 very helpful in playing itself out in professional criminal areas, because they will calculate what they're doing based on it. And I think actually they're more necessary for state courts than for federal courts, because with the sentencing guidelines that the federal courts have, you come pretty close to having mandatory minimums and maximums and and a judge a judge's discretion is restrained in a place like new york where there is no restraint on discretion they would be enormously valuable the areas where we have them we get a big impact the areas where we don't we're very much in need of them if i recall correctly uh, while you were the federal prosecutor uh, years back that uh, you advocated uh, prosecutions, even at the federal level, of street pushers, <laughs> yeah. uh, because believing sort of in the broken window theory that you've got to prosecute crime at all levels. And uh, is, are we having the right balance in terms of, of our federal law enforcement, uh, of going after the kingpins and the big dealers versus the, uh, the street pushers? You should do more street level prosecution. U.S. attorneys should. That was, a, it, that was a very valuable exercise for me and for my office as United States Attorney. What, what, we, what we did was we would take in a small number, because that's all we could really do, of street-level cases. We started it in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It was called Federal Day. We would never let the drug dealers know the day of the week it was going to be. Some days it would be a Wednesday, some days a Thursday, some days a Friday. But when they came into federal court, with the ability to focus more on an individual case, they tended to have high bails, so they didn't go right back out on the street. They were getting 10 and 15 year sentences for what they would spend a year in jail in the New York State system for. It had a massive impact. It was a tremendous learning experience for me because after we did it for about three months, all of the other crimes in the Lower East Side went down by 30, 40, and 50 percent. It taught me firsthand that if you put the emphasis on drug enforcement, you can reduce all other crimes. Let me see if I can get a couple quick questions in. Uh, the FBI uh, was started in the early 80s being engaged in the drug war and in drug prosecutions, uh, supporting the DEA and our federal effort. Uh, do you see the same uh, commitment on part of the FBI today as was initiated in the early 80s? And secondly, I want to ask a question. Do you believe the drug war is winnable? That's a, that, that is an e excellent question, because I think the, the right answer to that is it's winnable to the extent that the reduction of any social problem is winnable. It, it is as winnable as turning around welfare, which nobody thought you ever could do, and now the successes are faster than I even believe was possible, and I was in favor of turning it around. Uh, if we have the national will, we can 
Maybe we can't win the war on drugs, and maybe that isn't the right way to describe it. We can vastly reduce the problem of drugs. We could reduce the problem of drugs as fast and as quickly as we have turned around welfare, and we need it even more. But the national will isn't there, and no, I don't, I don't see it as a lack of commitment on the part of the FBI or the DEA. I think they have tremendous commitment. I think this has to be something that goes to the very top. I mean, the President of the United States has to lead the effort against drugs if you want it to affect our foreign policy. If, if you want us to enforce our priorities on other countries, which is what we're really talking about, then it has to be a major obsessive concern of our foreign policy apparatus. They should be as concerned about that as they are wars in various parts of the world, settling border disputes, dealing with international trade, because, frankly, if we don't turn around the problem of drugs, then, you know, we're going to lose a very, very large percentage of our young people. And this is enormously important to the United States of America, and our foreign policy should be driven by the things that are important to the United States of America. And I don't see that kind of commitment at the foreign policy level, at the border patrol level, and I honestly don't see the commitment to even law enforcement that used to be the case when I was more familiar with it in the 70s and the 80s. But I'm not as familiar with that part of it as I was eight or ten years ago. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just say amen to that last one. Mr. Blagojevich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mayor, um, you mentioned a moment ago uh, street-level prosecutions. Can you talk a little bit about the concept of uh, a community uh, prosecution. I know you have it in Brooklyn and Man the community prosecution program, which you have in, uh, as I understand it, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan. Uh, and if I could just tell you that uh, the president's 21st century policing initiative calls for $200 million of federal funds to be dispersed to the various community prosecution programs across the country. I have letters from the different uh, district attorneys from across the country, the National District Attorney's Office arguing for that money. Last year, the president asked for $50 million. Uh, we were able to fund it to the level of $5 million. Um, I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on the program, how it's working in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and the level of funding uh, that you, we received last year, which, in my view, was significantly too little, and that's $5 million, as well as the president's request for the $200 million. Well, the community, uh, there, there are two different two different things, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm responding to the right thing. Community courts and community policing. You're asking about community courts? I'm talking about the community prosecution program, the idea right. that you have prosecutors in neighborhoods that work closely with community leaders, sort of the extension of the right. COPS program. We have, we, have, uh, we have two programs like that, and they work very, very well. And they allow, us to put, they allow us to put focus on a lot of the quality of life crimes that if you went to a higher court, citywide court, uh, we just wouldn't get the same kind of attention because in that court they're going to be dealing with the person who was arrested for murder, the person who was arrested for rape, the person who was arrested for the f far more serious crimes. It allows communities to have more innovative solutions to problems. W one, of the, one of the things that we've made a lot of inroads in that might not seem like a big thing, but it is, I think, in many, many ways, is reducing graffiti. Graffiti is an act of vandalism city that has increasing amounts of graffiti is a city that has increasing amounts of people who are vandals and disrespect the rights of other people. A city that has reduction in graffiti is a city that's moving in the right direction. One of the things we do in our community program is if we catch someone doing graffiti, what we will often do is just have the person sentenced to five days or ten days of cleaning up graffiti. It has a practical result. It cleans up a lot of the graffiti in the neighborhood, but it also has a symbolic and maybe even teaches a lesson, teaches the person how important this is. And our community courts and our community programs have allowed us to do that. I think they're very valuable. I don't know what the right level of financing of them would be, but we could certainly expand them and they would be valuable in any place in which we operated them. And Ms. Mr. Mayor, you've got prosecutors in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. so that they're just not seeing um community leaders when they come to court as complaining witnesses, but they're also out there working with the yes. community leaders on a daily it gives, basis? It gives, it gives them a sense of the priorities of a neighborhood. I mean, New York City is so large that this is probably even more valuable to us than it might be to a smaller, to a smaller city or town. Uh, in many ways, the local court 
which would be, let's say, in downtown Brooklyn, can be very, very far away from the concerns of a neighborhood that's many, many miles away. When the prosecutors are actually in that neighborhood, then they know in this neighborhood, when somebody comes in and is complaining about radios being on late at night and making a lot of noise, this is a real, this is a real problem for them. And therefore, we should be doing something about it. it it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program that is very sensitive to the differing concerns that occur in different neighborhoods, and it's very valuable. And fair to say that if there was more federal funding for programs like that, you'd have places to place more of those neighborhood prosecutors, <laughs> yes. right? Okay. Yes, sir. My next question, Mr. Mayor, is um, legislation that isn't going on in New York, but it's potentially going on in Florida, and that is the, the possibility that, uh, in fact, Florida State House legislation was introduced that would make it a felony for a locality to sue a gun manufacturer. Uh, can you share your thoughts on, on that idea with us? I, I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that idea. I, I can only share my idea. ideas as a, as a lawyer. I don't think you can make access to the courts of a felony. It would not doesn't make sense to me. Okay, and of course you have no opposition to suing gun manufacturers. Oh, no, right no, I think, the, uh, look, I, got, I stopped having opposition to suing after I became mayor of New York City and there were about 90,000 lawsuits against me, the more the merrier. Okay. But uh, I don't see how you can block access to courts. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, we have a, a, an official from Florida here who might be willing after the break to answer those questions for you, Mr. Bogorovic. Thank you. Uh, well, we've gone a little bit beyond our time. I understand you have uh, another commitment, uh, so the committee will stand in recess and hear from the next panel at 1.30. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank I you, Mr. Mayor. You've done a good job. Pretty. I'm Harry Shorstein. I'll follow you this afternoon. I'm the fellow from Florida. Yes, they do. It's ending. I don't know where it's going. Thank you. Coming up after the rest of the crime prevention hearing, a Senate hearing on the Interior Department's oversight of the Indian Trust Fund. Testifying, Interior Secretary